Welcome everybody. Thank you. It's really nice to see you here this evening. My name is Sam Faulkner and I'm the interim head of school at Murray House School of Education and Sport. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the sixth David Rafe Memorial Lecture today. David Rafe was Professor of Sociology of Education at the University of Edinburgh, which he joined in 1975 as a member of the Centre for Educational Sociology. He went on to become its director for many years, and from 2002 to 2007, he was the director of research for the Murray House School of Education. I'm sure he would have been delighted that so many of you have been able to join us here this evening. And I'm also pleased to welcome his son, Dr. Alistair Rafe, here with us tonight. Alistair continues the family's connection with the University as Senior Lecturer in the School of History, Classics and Archaeology. Tonight's lecture is by Professor Gillian McCluskey, who was a colleague of David's. I expect that, as well as remarking on his intellectual ability, she will also remember him as a generous and supportive colleague who displayed integrity, modesty, and openness in all of his encounters. But I'd like to briefly reflect on the impact that David made. Indeed, he made an immense contribution to education in Scotland, nationally and internationally, through his research and his engagement with the wider policy world, serving on committees of the Scottish and the UK governments, and on public educational bodies, he contributed to various international fora and provided consultancies to bodies such as the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development and the European Center for the Development of Vocational Training. The breadth of David's research was truly impressive. He studied secondary and post-secondary education, curriculum and qualifications reforms, credit and qualifications frameworks, vocational education and training, and we go on, Transitions to work and higher education, and in all of these areas, his research was highly influential, and he established a truly international reputation. But what defined his distinctive contribution was his interest in using academic research to contribute to policy reformation. This theme was reflected in his academic work and in his engagement with policy. He said specifically, that much of his research was motivated by a desire to explain, critically analyze, and to inform policy. He was deeply committed to social justice and greater equality and wanted research to make a difference, especially in the Scottish context. It is a mark of his contribution that Murray House School of Education and Sport continues to support this memorial lecture series. So in keeping with David's work, the underlying theme of the Memorial Lecture Series is inequality in education, its effect on individuals' transitions and life chances, and how policy might make a positive difference. And so the topic of the lecture tonight could not be more pertinent. Gillian's lecture draws on the concept of home international comparative research across the four nations of the UK that David pioneered in the 1980s. He saw this approach as a way to gain a better understanding of core educational issues by investigating policy and provision in each of the nations which share broadly similar social, economic, and cultural contexts. Although international comparisons were and remain popular, especially among politicians, the extent of social, economic, and cultural differences between the UK and most other European countries and those in East Asia and North America can limit their value. In contrast, more focused comparison between the home nations of the UK offers more scope to tease out the specific effects of different policies and institutional arrangements in each nation. Gillian's lecture uses this home international concept to shed light on the context, causes and consequences of exclusion and how policy might respond. She is tonight joined by Dr. Ian Thompson from Oxford University, who is principal investigator of the ESRC funded Excluded Live Studies. Ian has kindly agreed to act as a discussant this evening. So I would just like to welcome you all again. 
And I would now like to pass over to Gillian. Thanks, Gillian. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Thanks very much indeed, Sam. Can I just check the mic is working? Yeah, that's good. Thanks for that. Um, so a really warm welcome to everybody in the hall tonight. Um, thank you very much for coming out on a rather cold February evening. Um, and a warm welcome to folks joining us online as well uh, from lots of different places, which is really quite exciting. And uh, if you're viewing the recording at a later date over your conflicts, hello to you too, because I know there are some people who will be doing that. Um, what I am going to try to do tonight is um, to take some of the ideas that helped us form the project I'm currently involved with. And then to look at the findings from some of the work that we've been doing, um, along with um, actually quite a number of people in the room, which is a delight, but particularly with Ian Thompson, who's going to very kindly act as discussant later on, and Ian is the lead of the project overall. You'd probably also be my chief heckler, I'm just warning you now. <clears throat> so I'm going to pick up on some of the things that Sam said by way of setting the context. David had an enduring concern, thank goodness, because I think we all need it, in, uh, for the comparative study of education systems. And from that, also, that there was a lot to learn where our systems are quite closely aligned, that there's more to learn, perhaps. So the fact we're doing this, what he called home international comparison in our large study, that I'll talk about a bit more in a minute, was a particular, hopefully would be particularly interesting. Um, he was always concerned about social inequalities and social justice and moves towards that. And particularly interested also in how we can use our own research to contribute to policy formation. I'm going to talk about school exclusion tonight, but I am kind of aware that although I live and breathe school exclusion, it isn't what everybody's interested in. I find it hard to believe, but I, I'm so I'm told. So I just want to say a little bit about what I mean by school exclusion. I'm talking about those processes by which schools um, take young people out of their normal learning environment, whatever that is, uh, in primary school, in secondary school, in other kinds of educational settings as well. I'll be talking mostly about official exclusion, um, but I will also be asking you to kind of think about, and I will come back to, unofficial exclusion. So all those ways in which young people can be put out because their behaviour is seen as disruptive or challenging or troublesome or they're being guilty of indiscipline. There are so many different phrases for it. And exclusion itself is a term that's used in a lot of different ways as well. I'll probably say excluded, but in different country contexts, we might be talking about expulsion or we might be talking about suspension. So I'm going to be just saying excluded for the sake of using one term. Um, and I said I'd be talking specifically about the project that myself and some colleagues in the room, some people online as well, um, have been involved with now for four and a half years. This is a large project and it looks across Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland and England. And it's called The Political Economies of School Exclusion and the Consequences. It's a long title. We tend to call it Excluded Lives. We also did notice quite early on that if we said perhaps that we were going into a school to do with police, it sounded too much like police and that therefore we might not get a very good reception. So we've always said excluded lives just to make it uh, handy, easy to work with. But it also, of course, tells us something about what our broader concerns are. That the exclusion is not just about what happens in that particular instance, that event, that it can have repercussions that go out across a person's life. And I want to come back to that, of course, later on. I want to start with some statistics. Um, I'm going to, one of the things we've been able to do in the project is look at the exclusion rates across the four nations of the UK. And I was saying to a couple of people before we started tonight, some of this may seem as though you'd be saying, well, didn't we know all this already? Surely some of this work had already been done. And I think we're often surprised to find how little comparative work has been done across the UK. Um, it seems so self-evident that we would want to learn from our nearest neighbours and that we would have much in common to talk to each other about and that there would be something synergistic about doing so. But actually, there was relatively little. So even to bring this table to talk about is actually quite a recent development. 
to be able to talk about these statistics together. So I think what I want to do is just pause and have a look at what you can see here. Can I just say, first of all, as well, that I'm going to stop at when COVID starts. It really is too soon to be talking about what's going to happen from COVID and then onwards. Um, to be honest, I did have a quick look to see. When I say quick, you know what it's like. I started, probably spent at least a day actually looking at all, at all the statistics since uh, we've come back, at, since the um, emergency phase of uh, COVID and the aftermath. So when, when schools started to um, go back to normal and see if there was anything that could usefully be said in the statistics, they are not there yet. Um, they are of interest, but I think only because they may start to begin to tell us something over time um, in and of themselves. I don't think they are what we should look at tonight, but we've got plenty still that we can look at. So here we've got, um, I'll look first at Northern Ireland. It's the yellow on the bottom. And you can see that their rates of temporary exclusion are really quite low and they stay that way. They dip down a bit more. You can see Scotland, which is the green triangles. It was actually quite high, as you can see, going back to uh, 2006, seven, And it's come steadily down over time. Wales started out, that's the red, started out just about the same, but maybe slightly higher than England when these records began. And you can see some dips, but the general pattern is down with a slight dip back up. And when we look at England, there's a sharp rise, a drop, and then a steady increase. Now, obviously these numbers are bigger, but the rates are what we're looking at here. Yeah. So what we're seeing is that England should give us some concern and actually, that was probably one of the really big drivers for us getting funding for the, stu for the study, was the fact that the, the rates in England were continuing to rise, were a big concern, and it looked like there was a contrast in what was happening in the other smaller nations. So that was our starting point, if you like. We've got these differences in the rates of exclusions. And of course, we wondered, and we started to delve into in the project, well, is it something about the context, the country contexts? And we've done a lot of work in the project, actually, around looking at the socio, uh, political, policy contexts in these different countries. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that tonight, but we have written about it quite a lot. Um, uh, myself and my colleague Alice Toll, who's part of the project as well, have done some work, particularly looking at uh, the discourses in, for instance, the different policy documents on exclusion in England and Scotland, which was really interesting, if uh, a bit challenging. Uh, so we have done that work, but actually I want to move on to something else tonight, which is looking at reasons for exclusion. So first of all, just a reminder, yes, we've got differing rates of exclusion. Yes, we've got different contexts, but reminding ourselves that as David Rafe tells us, actually, perhaps we are close enough that there's a lot we can learn from each other when we look at these countries together. So let's look at those reasons. So I've got colleagues in this room that have been working on this for a very long time or worked on this before they retired. And they will be disappointed, I think, to see that the reasons that we knew in the past are still the same reasons. And look how similar they are. We look at England. Persistent disruptive behaviour is the most common reason for putting a child out of their normal uh, learning environment. Persistent infringement of the rules is the term in Northern Ireland. In Scotland, we prefer to talk about general or persistent disobedience. And in Wales, the term is persistent disruptive behaviour. Now, just for interest, because we've actually been doing some uh, really useful conversations with colleagues in California, I thought it would be interesting to pick up on what their most common reason for exclusion is. And lo and behold, it's called willful defiance not a million miles away from what we have used ourselves. And that actually changed. So I wanted to make, make that point that um, that uh, use of that term uh, changed in October. But till then, it was willful defiance. And because I thought, well, okay, maybe it means something different, I thought I would double check. So they very helpfully tell us exactly what they mean by willful defiance. And that's a student who has disrupted school activities or otherwise willfully de defied the valid authority of teachers, administrators, 
and other school officials. So what we begin to see is some differences in rates of exclusion in country context, but some perhaps interesting similarities. And I want to delve a bit deeper into that. What about those other similarities? Now, I think whether you work in education or youth work or social work or criminal justice or health or housing, none of this on this slide should, will surprise because the same characteristics appear again and again. I could have filled the slide with different kinds of data about disproportionality and overrepresentation, but just two examples to try to indicate what the issues are. Being a boy, being entitled to free school meals, living in a deprived neighbourhood, being care experienced, having low attainment, having poor attendance, all increased risks of exclusion. And then from a later uh, piece of work, excluded children are the most vulnerable, twice as likely to be in care, four times more likely to grow up in poverty seven times more likely to have a special educational need and 10 times more likely to suffer recognised mental health problems. Now, these are all statistics that come to us from before COVID. And those of us who work in any sphere of social policy will be aware that our concerns are probably deepened as we move through the deepening impacts of COVID and begin to see that play out in schools. So we've got something that is different about our context, something that's different about the rates of exclusion, and yet, we have some really striking and quite concerning similarities. And I think what's interesting, and maybe just to say it again, is that it's the comparative study that's allowed us to surface this. Yeah. So it's not just about one country. It's, I mean, it's always been useful to be able to say over time, isn't it awful that general and persistent disobedience has been the most common reason for exclusion for such a long time in Scotland, for example. But now we can say with strength, kind of with real robustness, Actually, this isn't just a problem for one country. It seems to be a problem for these four countries. And I think a really strong argument for thinking about ways that we should be working much closely together to try and tackle them. And I think there's something else, isn't there? Something else we'd want to be aware of in the background here. I've mentioned the pandemic. But I think there are other things that crosswinds, there are other um, background factors that are really, really important that we can't afford to ignore. We've lived for a long time, for some children and young people, it will be their entire schooling career in a time of austerity economics with gross underfunding of schools and all the other parts of the education system. I think we have increasing evidence across a range of measures that schools are stressed systems, that there is so much pressure on different aspects of, of staff who try day in, day out to do a really, really good job by the children and young people they work with, um, but in under-resourced facilities and with lack of resources for the kinds of things they, they need and want to do their jobs well. And we have children and young people in dire need of more support, even just financial support, to be able to, to enable them to get the most out of school. And I'm thinking here of work that's been done by other colleagues on the cost of the school day, um, really important work, which draws our attention to the, the real stresses, the really basic needs that some children find it difficult to meet to come to school. So I think that we need to be aware of those broader contexts as well, when we're thinking about reasons for exclusion. So far, perhaps okay, perhaps not too many surprises. I want to move on to something a bit more contentious. In this research that we've been undertaking and in lots of other research, the phrase, these things here are phrases that schools, the teachers often invoke when they really don't want to exclude somebody, but they feel they have no other options. They will say, we really need to think about the rights and needs of the others in the class. We have to show, we have to show that there is something that isn't okay. There have to be boundaries. 
We have to have a deterrent. We need to signal that this isn't acceptable. And one that we hear more and more is that we have to think about the health and safety of everybody in, in the system. And I've set this alongside what I think is quite a big challenge to that. And I want to go into that challenge a bit more. I was looking through, in fact, I, I, I Googled, I think, if I remember rightly, what about the other 29? And I found that in um, there's there's a group that, like, yeah, you pr probably can see it. I wasn't sure if you're looking at the screen. NME doesn't stand for New Musical Express. People are sort of old enough to remember that. <laughs> it stands for No More Exclusion, okay? And that is a body who are concerned, it's a, a group who are really concerned about the disparities of race in our exclusion figures. Okay. So yes, on the one hand, we've got these calls for exclusion when I, I genuinely know that teachers are trying to do their best. But on the other hand, we have these entrenched dispro disproportionalities and over-representation that kind of is pulling in the other direction. So I think it's worth us delving a bit more into whether these invocations actually hold water. What, what evidence do we have? Now I've got two slides here. This one and the next one, I'll show you the next one as well. Okay, they're both really dense. You know, when you're preparing a PowerPoint, everybody says, keep it clean, keep it simple, couple of points, don't go too much. I've done it deliberately, actually, because I think it's really important that we see how much evidence there is. This is all really robust evidence. This is not, I've tried to go for the, you know, the most robust studies that really support this. There are really strong reasons against the use of exclusion. And this evidence comes from a number of countries. Some of it actually is done uh, in the UK. Some of it's done within our own project. Some of it was done by other colleagues uh, not too far away from here. But all of these things touch on different ways in which we can look at the different individual level impacts of school exclusion and why we shouldn't be doing it at all, in my view. We need to remember that for many, school is a place of safety. And that place of safety may not be available in any other part of that child's life. We need to think about the mental health supports that can be accessed when a child is in education because it's the only place that children have to be. You know, they can, they can, there are lots of other ways to avoid um, getting help or to not be in a place where it can be offered. And school can offer that in a way that nothing else does. Okay. So we might say, okay, but maybe that is still a cost we need, we need to meet. Maybe it's a price we have to pay because we need our system to be good and okay we feel very concerned about those individuals and maybe we do need to do more to support them but actually the school still needs to operate doesn't it and the other 29 still matter and i'm going to move on to my even denser slide and i don't expect you to be able to read all that but i do want to say we have a really important and growing body of evidence the last slide was perhaps stuff that you know people in the field know quite well there's new evidence emerging all the time but we know quite a lot already about the impacts on individual young people who experience exclusion but our assumptions about what else is happening i think have, have been wrong and i think this evidence which is now this unfortunately there's nothing in the uk i've had to look elsewhere which is a problem in itself i know um, and you can come back to me and harass me about that if you want. But we can see now we need to be asking questions, not just about the use of exclusion because it affects individuals, but that it because it also has detrimental effects on the school in terms of engagement of the whole school, in terms of feelings of safety, in terms of achievement and attainment for that school community. Now, I think that may surprise some people, and I think that probably does indicate we need to think about it much more carefully. One of the things that we can see in here is that um, that uh, distinction between official exclusion and maybe hidden unofficial exclusion is slightly breaking down when we look at this. Um, I'll maybe say a little bit more about that if I've got time. 
but the distinction between ex official exclusion and hidden exclusion or internal exclusion or unofficial exclusion or unlawful exclusion um, is something we really need to I think to probe more into to understand what's going on. So I suppose that's my challenge. What do we do with this? We've got this information. Um, I raised this as an issue really recently in quite a public forum. Um, and um, particularly this, this, this newer, newer evidence around the, the detrimental impacts on school community. Um, and I said that the evidence was really strong and I provided the evidence, uh, I provided the references later on to, um, to government and I haven't had a response yet. Um, so, can I just start to pull things together now? I think, actually, I actually have no idea how long I've been talking for. Can somebody keep me right? I did time it, sorry. It's just, I don't know where I am now. That's good, that's good. That's great, okay. I'm gonna be quicker then, that's really nice. Um, so, what I'm trying to draw together here is that we have a situation where um, we know quite a lot about official levels of exclusion. We can look at the data. We've got pretty good statistics. We're in the fortunate position of being in countries that gather statistics reasonably well. We can argue about that. There are, there are differences between uh, Scotland doesn't do it in the same way as England in some ways, but we do have reasonably good data compared with many other countries. That's a great start. We can definitely say that official levels of exclusion differ. And it's also worth saying that even when they differ across countries, they still also differ, differ at local level and local schools. So local schools, individual schools can make a real difference. And we can see differences in rates in different areas. But overall, we can say something about the official levels of exclusion. What's going, under, what's going on underneath that, I think probably we do not know enough about. And that's been the case for quite a long time. But I think probably it's possible that as the pressure to decrease official exclusions has become more prominent in policy terms, it may well be that exclusion in, of those other kinds is being pushed up in a kind of whack-a-mole situation. Uh, we don't know that. We can make some pretty educated guesses, but we have nothing like the mapping of official exclusion that we can kind of rely on. There's nothing like that that tells us about all those other different ways that might, the exclusion might be happening. And I think the complexity of it is added to by the fact that many of the things that schools seek to do to support individual young people who they feel are at risk of exclusion, who are, who are vulnerable, and who they are seeking to care for may inadvertently make things worse. And we don't actually know. So when we talk about a child who's in a nurture room or who is an inclusion base um, um, or who is on a part-time timetable, for example, those may be things that um, are done with the very best of intentions. And it may be a huge relief to the youngster that those things are happening. They may be helpful at that, that point. But what we don't have a good line of sight to is what that's like at a national level. What kind of patterns and trends are in there? Do we see the same patterns of disproportionality? Can we see anything at all, returning to David Ray's concerns, about engagement, attainment, participation? How are these things affected? And what are the lifelong effects of those kinds of um, maneuverings to, which are intended to support children and young people, but they may not all, they may, we just don't know. So I think we absolutely do need to prioritize that kind of work and that kind of re research. I think we can say now that policy contexts matter and probably quite a lot, but we won't know enough to be able to answer that accurately until we have a much broader picture of what exclusion is like. My concern, as it is with many others, is to think about those disproportionalities. And what I think should concern us particularly is that even when exclusion rates decline, when they decrease over time, as they did in the, the graph I showed earlier, the dispropor disproportionalities still pertain. They don't go away. They don't diminish. They remain constant. 
So those youngsters who are experiencing marginalization, who are minoritized, who feel disenfranchised with an education because they're poor or because their parents have mental health problems, those things don't change. They haven't changed. They don't change if the exclusion rate is low and they don't change if the exclusion rate goes down. So there is something we have yet to understand about what happens in schools and what, what, what we might do, what levers we could pull to try and change some of that. I find it fascinating that the reasons given for its decisions to exclude, which I looked at earlier, for instance, the, the willful defiance, the one in California, are so entrenched and so similar. And again, I think, what is that about? I'm definitely not saying that children are being excluded for minor reasons. I don't think that's the case. I think when we get that, that category, you know, that, that phrase in use, it, it, it just, it's a summary of something that's broken down, a relationship that's broken down. It's just a label, but why is it that we've still got the same labels? Why have we not managed to shift all that? So what's happening underneath it that we still need to understand? And I think, basically, I would say that school exclusion fails in its stated aims. I think instead what we can see is it produces a range of negative outcomes for individual pupils, for staff as well, not just for the children, and for the schools themselves. And if we're picking up on the concerns that, that drove the work that David Rafe was involved with, we can see here how it reproduces inequalities and impedes progress towards social justice overall. Oh, sorry. So what? Okay, so it's just one thing, isn't it? It's just one thing in education. And I said at the start, you know, not everybody is, is, is um, focuses on school exclusion as a thing. But I think there are probably good, really good reasons for us to think about maybe exclusion as a sort of barometer at the moment of what's happening in education. We know the, the negative impacts of exclusion on individuals. I've shared with you some of the more recent research and it's good quality, robust research with large sample sizes. And it tells us about the negative impacts of exclusion on schools. I think we also, it's a given that we should have concerns about COVID and what some people call a COVID generation coming through schools. If we're concerned about all of those things, and I think we should be, and I think we are, then there's an urgency to what we do next. It isn't just about exclusion. It's about what exclusion signals about our system and about our systems. And the fact that we have a kind of natural lab in a sense, of four countries together facing these same issues means that we should continue to look at, these, look at comparative work. It has enormous value. I hope I've been able to share some of what it has already given us, even if it's only raised, of course, being a researcher, it's raised more questions than answers. But I do think what it has done is of real value because of the kinds of questions it gives us confidence to ask again and to ask now. So... I suppose I'm just leaving you with that thought that I do think exclusion, whether it's your field or not, may be a really useful barometer of what else might be happening. So it's, I think it's important in and of itself, but also for ethical reasons, and I think also probably for economic reasons too. So thank you very much indeed. I'll stop there. A rising concern in England at the time of, of huge rates of permanent school, school exclusions and and when I say huge rates, we're talking about 7,000 in, 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 in one year. At the time of Scotland, I think it was about three at the time, and they've gone down to even less, less than that. So, you know, we, we, the work that, that, that David did and um, thinking about the specificities of something, things that are similar but actually have real contrast has been really important to us um, th throughout. And, and on the face of it, this is the easiest project in, in the world because um, – when uh, Professor Harry Daniels, who, who co-led this project, he claims to have retired uh, now, but I see no sign of that. But you know what academics are like. But when when um, ha Harry coined the phrase excluded lives sometime back in 2013, 2014, he was thinking about all those kids who go under the radar, all those children who are not doing well 
because of, of things that are not their, their fault in, in, in society. And, and I say that this project, when we got the, the four, uh, we call them nations here, we actually call them jurisdictions. Language is a funny thing, isn't it? You know, we have to be very careful with the language we use. And if you want to know why we use jurisdictions, I'll explain it to, to, to you later. But well, the face of it was so easy because England have massively high uh, uh, permanent exclusion rates, Scotland almost none. At the time, Wales very low, Northern Ireland very, very low. Suspensions, similar, but actually suspensions went down everywhere else. But underneath, and as, Alan, uh, as Julian's pointed out, um, and we often use the iceberg analogy in excluded lives, so a huge amount goes on uh, under under the radar. What What is not a, um, deemed officially exclusion clearly is. And uh, our colleagues in, in Wales did a piece about children being in the corridor um, a lot of the time in, in in any school day, and those children do just as badly in terms of of statistics at the end of 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 their their school year as children who are permanently it, it, it excluded. So it, it's the things that are happening beneath the the, the 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 surface. But the other side of it is something which which is is it's really quite stark for us in England compared to being in Scotland. I love coming to Scotland because it, it's. We know it's a nice place in excluded lives because we can look at what happens in terms of the, the policy direction in in England and the discourse in England, which frankly is quite brutal. If I if I'm if I'm honest, you only have to be on Twitter and have anything to do with education in England, you'll know it's a it's a nasty uh, world out there. And and we uh, it's a very crude analogy, but I think it's a useful one. In Scotland, you tend to talk when you talk about what's happening in school about relationships that tends to be the word that that is the drip through yes behavior is there a little bit as well but it's mostly about rela relationships in england you it's behavior behavior all the way through and if you try to save relationships there are certain people who not only shout you down but actually do do much worse than that in in, in the english context cont cont so as julian said if we know but if we know that exclusion is a bad thing and you know, all that evidence is there. We've got more evidence, colleagues. We've done some quantitative work. We've done qualitative work. There's lots of evidence. And we know that in England in particular, it hits kids for, with, with certain ethnicity. So it's 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 a race problem. It, it's about poverty. It's a, it's about uh, so, social class. It's about SEND. It's about care. All these things, if we know it, as Gillian said, why is it's still a problem? Why are things um, st still getting well? And I could throw something else in as well. Some of our colleagues in the London School of Economics are doing some work on the economics of school exclusion. It's enormously expensive at every single level, at the individual level, at the, at the school level, at the institutional level, at the local authority level, at society level, and it goes on and on and on and on. And What's worrying, I think, particularly in England, and and this is this is what I'm trying to push out for this di discussion, is I think it might be getting worse across the UK. So where we've had this sort of rosy-eyed look at what's going on uh, at the rest of, of the UK and said that England's really bad, actually the discourse in England is creeping into either other places, and we talk about the, the tension in England between performativity doing well in league tables, doing making sure the children do well uh, in their exams and the inclusion and its performativity is overriding the, the needs of, of many, many young people. And if you look at what the governments, and I'm not knocking any particular government, but you look what governments talk about when they talk about education, they talk about league tables. They talk about PISA, actually, PISA league tables. And you think of what that is, it's another test which is designed in a certain way to measure certain things. It doesn't really measure very much actually, and the results of those can have hugely detrimental uh, effects for those very young people that we talked about are excluded uh, the most. So this is a worry. This is a worry. When Gillian talked about the effects of austerity, it's funny, do you remember when we, we had some, when we couldn't get into schools because of the COVID, so we did lots of talks with people online, some policy makers, lots of professionals from all sorts of diff different backgrounds, and we all and they all said things are going to get really bad after COVID. Kids will not go back to school. It's true, isn't it? Twenty percent of kids are not going back back to school. They said it's going to get worse for SEN. It's true. 
And what everyone said, not just us in that, those, those discussions online, there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a better way of thinking about education than just about results. Has it happened? No, it hasn't. If, if we were to follow that line that Julian showed earlier for England, suspensions have gone right up again in, in, the, in the last year. So maybe that's the question that we're posing in excluded lives. If we've given some answers on the project, um, hopefully <laughs> hopefully some quite quite good discussions. And, and we have had people like the DfE listen to us, not in the way that happens in Wales, Northern Ireland, Scotland, where you're more likely to be able to hear to, from a minister, but we have had some from response. But the question is really, what sort of education do we want? Do we want an education system that is truly inclusive, that is truly thinking about the, the issues that David, I think, rose in terms of social inclusion and so, social justice, or do, do we want one that just measures performance? I think you're getting another mic. Okay. So that sounds like a challenge I can't answer. Like, of course, I want a better system. <laughs> but I think the only thing I would say um, is that I, I get concerned when we set, uh, you know, achievement or attainment against inclusion, because I don't think that gets us any further forward. And I think probably um, what we have to do is to keep thinking about the two things together. Because I don't, I, don't, I don't think we will get anywhere. I think we've tried that. We've tried saying one matters more than the other. Um, we've, you know, different people will argue about different, different things being more important. But essentially, a child doesn't separate those two things out. A child wants to feel safe and to be able to do their best in school. And good teachers want that for them. So there is absolutely no point in separating the two. They shouldn't be in. They shouldn't be in competition with each other. Um, we've got some great work by um, a retired colleague, um, retired colleagues, Martin Rouse, Al Lani Florian, who looks at that in huge detail. So let's not fall into that trap in trying to solve this problem. And fall into another uh, um, kind of mistake that's been made. And I think we should we should set that one aside right from the start. Um, I guess one of the things I didn't say, and I maybe could pick up on, is that Ian's kind of say, Ian's uh, talking about suspensions, and I said I'd use just exclusion. When he's using that word, he's talking about England, because we don't use that word officially here. We do unofficially, I know that. But so he's talking about temporary exclusions, weren't you, Ian? Mm. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> um, and I didn't really talk about permanent exclusions, and I had a reason for that. I thought about it. But the, the, the rates, are, they're the numbers, the rates and the numbers are so stark, okay? So it's almost beyond belief. So what did you say for England seven? Well, we're in, talking about in, the, in the year just before, before the pandemic. Yeah, uh -huh, which it was, yeah, 7, 000, it was nearly 8,000. Right, right, nearly 8,000 yeah. individual instances of exclusion in England, okay? And at the same time in Scotland, we had three, hmm. yeah? And that didn't used to be the case. It used to no, be it didn't used to be the case. So, so I could have talked about that, but to me, that's almost like it's 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 it asks more questions than it answers, and it's also about what happens at the very extreme of a system. And actually, I do think there's probably more to learn when we look at the things that are more common, that more commonly happen in and around schools than what happens at the very edges. I mean, some of us might be really interested in what happens around those permanent exclusions. But actually, there's probably more that we can kind of benefit from and focus on in terms of change when we look at those temporary exclusions because they affect more youngsters. Um, and I think that schools, you know, move closer or further away to it, uh, to, uh, to whether to consider an exclusion uh, much more often when it's temporary or suspend, suspended, as Ian was talking about. So just in case you were wondering why I focused on temporary exclusions, but Ian was mentioning permanent. Yeah. So I think we can see if there's any questions. Oh, right. Oh, we've got two questions online. Okay. I didn't know if they were up there. So 
I'll tell, shall I read out the question? Yeah. Should we now focus more on racial disproportionalities and disciplinary exclusion on school level variation between local authorities, multi academy trusts, and on formative intervention studies to address exclusionary practices? Should, I think we can take those in bits, can't we? Mm. Yeah. So, should we now focus more on racial disproportionalities and disciplinary exclusion? There's been a lot of work in North America looking at racial disproportionalities. Um, all of it really helpful because what it does is it illuminates those disproportionalities really clearly for us. And um, there, you know, is it's something that I think is a real feature of our UK system, although it plays out really differently in the different countries of the UK. Of the UK. Um, so I don't have any doubt at all that we need to think about that much, much more carefully. I don't I don't think that it's easy because um, in any one school, it's really likely that they're only excluding one or two children. And it's really hard then to see patterns that are affecting, you know, the, the bigger things in society. When you're, you've got one youngster in front of you for whom you feel like you've run out of options. Okay. And, uh, and I do appreciate that. It's really hard to see how that connects. But we can't deny that it does connect. I don't know if there's anything you'd add to that. Yeah, I mean, we, we feel we haven't, we haven't really got to this in the project, I, I must say, and I think it's a, it's, a, it's a real issue in England, probably higher than the other jurisdictions. So if you were to look at ethnicity and, and, and suspensions and, and actually permanent exclusions in Wales, for example, it's white working class boys, but you know, overwhelmingly are the numbers there. And I think that's probably true in, in, in Scotland, but it's also true in parts of England as well. So one of the problems when, when we talk about um, the nations, if you like, we tend to put them all together. So England is really bad. Scotland is really good. Not necessarily true. So there are bits of, it, of, of parts of England where the, you know, the, the exclusion uh, levels are, are, are much, much lower than comparable um, a, a areas. There are schools that try their best to do everything they, they possibly can. And there are systems that work very well and multi-agency working in some parts of the country. But it's but it's not true everywhere, and I think that question of of whether that the way a child looks. I mean, you, we have lots of instances of children being suspended for having the wrong type of hair. So if you have a Caribbean background, you are often going to run foul of having the wrong colour hair or not responding in the right way. So of not looking directly at someone when you're talking off of looking away or looking down or. Um, but actually, if you if you look straight into someone's eyes, to some teachers, that's that's, that's challenging their authority. So, um, yes, there's a lot of work to be done on 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 that. I forget what the second part was. The next bit's about um, informative. Uh, well, it's about school level variation. Yeah, and also um, interventions um, study. Yes, a, a, again, um, and it's interesting when you look at the evidence on interventions to produce exclusion um it's not very good actually there's you know there's evidence that shows the short-term effect in many cases but actually it goes back very 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 quickly because actually it's a system-wide problem you know there's something wrong with the system that allows or forces schools to be put in a position where they are forced or feel that they're forced to uh, exclude a, a child and often the schools say to us and that, I think this is a true across the, the UK that they don't want to do this but they can't meet that child's needs and they'll say much better the child is elsewhere because their needs will be met and that that's partly a, a funding issue. I think I was going to pick up on that because one of the things that I think Scotland has been really successful in doing is introducing restorative practices and restorative approaches across its education system, based on some work by some colleagues in the room. Fantastic, really successful. We have had a really major change in policy that emphasizes restorative working. But I was really taken aback really recently um, when um, somebody in a position of authority said that it wasn't working and that we needed to, uh, maybe we'd taken it too far and that we needed to stop thinking about that. And actually, you know, we should reintroduce a sort of tariff system so that if you've done a particular action, then a particular consequence would be tied to that. 
And um, I was really concerned because I think actually the underfunding and the under-resourcing and the lack of support for teachers to, to make sure that restorative work is done well is actually the issue. You know, I, I've, every time somebody will, will um, say that something's gone wrong, I think we need to ask, is it fully resourced? Is it doing the job it's set out to do and wants to do and can do? And there's research, really strong evidence says it can do if it's well resourced. And I suppose the other thing for me is also this general thing about support for teachers continuing professional development. You know, it is absolutely crucial and it is completely underfunded. You know, how can we expect, and I'm going to refer to COVID again, we're coming out of, you know, a time that none of us ever foresaw would happen. And we've got children at all different developmental stages who have got much more complex needs than we ever expected teachers to have to face. And they are stressed and they went through COVID themselves. You know, we have, I think to say it again, we have a really stressed system. We had it before COVID, the teacher burnout and, you know, difficulties of retaining head teachers and all those things. And now it's even more pressure. And yet somehow we cannot set aside the resources to support teachers to do their job properly, to ensure, for instance, if that they are a pastoral care teacher in a secondary school, that they have really good training and then ongoing support after they've had. Say, for instance, I'm just talking completely radically here, a year's course to learn how to do it properly over and above their basic training as a teacher. I really wanted to make a comment and ask a question, and in a sense, you've partly answered the question. Mm. I wanted you to think, Gillian, about why exclusions have continued to fall in Scotland, despite the dramatic change, really, in the levels of support for both children and teachers in terms of learning support and behaviour support. Can, well, can I make a comment as well, just quickly? Yeah. I think it's really interesting that earlier, earlier research on school exclusion tended to emphasise only the impact on children and families. And it's very interesting now that you're looking at a negative impact also on the institutions that are involved. Hmm. Yeah. So how, so your question is how is exclusion coming down despite those, despite these pressures in, in, for, in Scotland, for instance? Um, I don't think we know enough about it. A, I don't know if exclusion is coming down, actually. We've only got the official figures. And I'm really concerned about lots of other things that are happening in and around schools, which we might call alternatives to exclusion. But if we even did see that exclusion was coming down, then I think there might be, I mean, I suppose I'm going to be prejudiced, I'm going to be biased. I think some of that really strong work around school culture, school ethos, about relationships, the fact that our exclusions policy talks about children having distressed behaviour and that all behaviour is communication, we do not see that in any of the other three nations policy documents. So there's something about the things that we hold to be important and about the principles we work with. So despite all the difficulties, there's something there to hold on to. I know I'm prejudiced, but I do think it's really important. Can I go next? Oh, well, thank you very much for your presentation. My question, my, the, the, the aspect that caught my attention the most was the differentiation between the official exclusion and unofficial exclusion. I've been looking for informal quality or non-official quality or uh, invisible quality in higher education. And the only way that I could think about what doesn't get to be official is in contrast to policy. So I was wondering if in your research, when you, when you met evidence of what's unofficial exclusion, could that be related to what does not appear in the administrative process or the school administrative management in terms of literally the, the administration of, you know, checking the box, what does it need to be excluded? How do, how do I count the student exit? excluded how do i report this so could that be um 
I know that you have mentioned that there is not a lot, there's a lot to be known about an official exclusion. Have you been meeting any evidence towards this, this idea that the unofficial goes in contrast to the policy which would set ideally what's official? Thank you. Thanks for the question. I think I think I've understood it, but please correct me if not. And maybe I can have a go at this and then you can have a go as well, Ian. So at the moment, I think that um, we don't actually know whether things are exclusionary or inclus inclusive. So I think some of the things, it's not um, possible to see. And I think that was the point I was trying to make earlier, that we don't know, for instance, whether putting a child in our nurture room. We might know at an individual level, but we don't know at a national level what impacts that's having and whether in fact it helps sustain or rebuild engagement with, and then hopefully leading to achievement and a sense of belonging and all the things that help us grow into good, you know, good strong adults. Or in fact, whether the negative impacts of exclusion by not being in with your peers and not learning all the things that, that, that uh, you know the skills and the, the skills and practicing the skills of negotiation, for example, and getting ourselves out of difficulty by getting it wrong or by seeing a, an adult model an adult model it. And, you know all those things that we would miss because we're not in the room. We just don't know, and I think that's the miss, and that's why I think until we kind of have that big, bigger picture, because it's always been there. There's always been extra ways to do school, but I think we've seen an enormous proliferation of it over recent years. Sorry, I missed, I did miss that. Yes. 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 Yeah. 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 I don't know if you've got anything weird. Yeah, just, it's interesting. When you look at the exclusion policy, I'll talk about England, um, but it's true elsewhere. It's actually quite robust when you look at the protection for the child within the policy. You know, if you just looked at the policy and, and, and thought about it, so there's rights to appeal are, are quite robust. The, you know, the schools have to go through really quite um, difficult processes um, to exclude a child, and yet they, they, they still do. The reason I say it is my, 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 what we suspect that happens that some schools that haven't gone through that, that process where they've tried to be fair and listen to the child, they just take another route. And you know, we've heard, this is anecdotal, but we've heard it more than once. So um, you know, the evidence builds up of head teachers who, who say to a parent or a carer who's brought a child who's persistently in trouble, wouldn't it be better if you took them somewhere else, homeschool, move away, anything that would be here because we can't meet their needs. Well, that's exclusion, isn't it? So it's not, it's not called exclusion. Um, and it's interesting, a lot of the discussion, I, I can see it's interesting, we can see the discussion, but you, you can't. A lot of the discussion is, is around this sort of, sort, sort of area of, you know, what, what, what constitutes uh, inclusion? Why are the tolerance levels of schools so low? Why do teachers feel the only way out? And some teachers go on strike to exclude kids in parts of, parts of the, the, the UK. And it's Tony Gallagher who's on the project just from is in Belfast, uh, you know, he, he, he points out, actually, if you just flip that whole way around, so rather than um, think, think of the discourse that the, the, the exclusion is because a child has done something wrong, so they need punishing, the will to punish a car park and use that term a long term uh, time at the way. What if we flip the discourse around, say we as a school and a society fail because we're doing this? And that's a way to try and change the culture. And I think, with the point you were making earlier, I think that has happened to some degree in Scotland. Yeah, there was a real soul searching. What are we doing to these young people? Uh, and you hear it in parts of all over the UK. These are our children. We've got to do better. Whereas in other parts, that's simply not, you know, not happening. Thank you. Thanks very much for an absolutely fascinating, if somewhat depressing uh, account from someone who started off researching this in Scotland in the early 2000s. And you saying uh, about head teachers 
saying it's for in the best interest of the child if they're informally moved on resonates, mm. you know, all that time. Anyway, that wasn't my question. My question is, it follows on from Tony Gallagher's point in a way. Uh, people who dissent from systems tell you a lot about the system. And I wonder if either of you would like to say a little bit about your work interviewing children who've been excluded or who feel excluded and what you might have learned um, from that. Thank you. I can pick that up first of all, because we, okay. yeah, we, we, we talked, we did a policy discussion the day, actually, Ingrid obviously was here somewhere at the back, um, and Alice Toole and myself spoke to quite a lot of policy um, uh, people in, in, in England. We talked about the experiences, part of it was about experiences, and what, and what the youngsters tell us often is that um, some of them do sort of say, yes, it's fair, I did something. And I understand, uh, you know, that, that, that this might be better. But, it, but most of the time, they say they don't think it's fair because they weren't listened to, their needs weren't, weren't met, they were picked different, they were treated differently to someone else. Um, they never felt they belonged. That's a term they don't use that term necessarily, but they they felt that they were always something different. So we had a group of young people. Um, they were actually in one of our research advisory groups, and they talked about. Um, yeah, we we always know um, what the teachers think about us because they 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 stand around in the playground and they've got code names for when we come by. So and we know these codes, you know, because they're not bad these the, these kids. So they know that whatever whatever they do, even if they're having a nice day and being cheerful, they're still these kids. They are the the others. So um, yeah, I think it's it's a problem within. Within the system, you know, they, they, these 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 youngsters, but some of them are incredibly resilient, and and actually most of the ones we spoke to on this project are back in a mainstream school, almost all of them actually, and they were all doing reasonably well. And the reason we were allowed to speak to them was the schools were, were the gatekeepers to them, so they said, "Come and talk to this child." There may have been it permanently excluded from other school, but by and large, the school was doing something right, and and the kids felt that they belong in a, in a new place. Sometimes that was an alternative provision so that they felt, you know, that the teachers finally listened to them in these small alternative provisions. But, you know, their, their experiences were overwhelmingly um, negative about this, about the, the process, but often positive about individual teachers who really tried to listen to and have done, done their best. So it's, it's not all depressing, <laughs> I would hope to say. I suppose the, the thing I would add, and I'm thinking of some of the work, some of the work around with parents. Now, we didn't manage to involve very many parents in the project, but the stories they tell about trying to navigate school systems and what to do when things go wrong are really salutary. Um, there is, I take your point about a right of appeal, but for many people who have a lot on their plates already, I think it is unrealistic. Mm. And I think that uh, often parents are juggling so many things already that it's easier not to take on one more fight. Um, so I think it is really important to think about the youngsters, but also about the systems around about them and the families who are doing their very best, mm. but sometimes really not being helped by our systems. Every single parent we spoke to in England, um, yeah, um, it wasn't a huge amount, but 15 to 20, every single one was a woman. Mm. Every single one. Yeah, sometimes grandmother, but they were, they were all people who lost time off work or they, you know, that was seen as their primary responsibility. I think it said a lot. Yeah. Uh, before I begin, uh, I work for the Scottish Secondary Teachers Association, so that's where I'm coming from. Uh, and first thing, coming up, there's lots of things I want to say, but you've opened a whole uh, gambit of different things. And I think it's very hard to compare the different jurisdictions. Uh, I, I, I'm, I don't know if it's an advantage or a disadvantage. Uh, I did, uh, I taught in London for 25 years. I worked in Northern Ireland for eight years and I've worked here for near on, going on to 10 years in Scotland. Makes me very old when you had all those numbers up, <laughs> yeah. But 
there is a very big difference between those uh, jurisdictions. The, the schools are very much the same. Teachers are very much the same, but there's different drivers. And I think you need to take England out of that equation because it is completely different to the other three jurisdictions. Uh, because uh, to my experience is that uh, children are important in the other jurisdictions. Whereas in England, it's more about what's in the interest of the school or the academy or the organization than it is about the young people that you deal with. Uh, but uh, in well, I mentioned the, the, the SSTA initially, we've done lots of surveys with our members and the two biggest issues for members at the moment in Scotland is pupil behavior and workload. And workload is developed because there isn't enough, aren't enough teachers, aren't enough resources. So therefore you can see why many of our members are, are talking about leaving the profession in mid career, not at the end of 55, 57, it's people in their early 40s that are saying to us, it's time we get out. And I think that is an important way. But sorry, as I could go on for quite a while, but the, the two bits I want I think is important is that schools are a place of safety for many of our youngsters. And we don't put enough effort into actually building those relationships between the, the school and the family and the youngster to make sure that they see it as positive. Uh, and I will make a, a point about the numbers I think are very similar in terms of exclusion. I'm using that as wide as the informal and the formal exclusion, except it's done in different ways. So I think England, Scotland and Wales, I don't know Wales very well, uh, sorry, Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales, is I think the numbers are very much the same, but they're all hidden in a way that they're, they're represented. And I think uh, in terms of your studies, I think you need to put England over its over there and leave it there for a little bit but actually focus on the, the the interesting thing between those three jurisdictions sorry for going on a bit but yeah you've raised a question we've often also asked ourselves actually that is england so different is what's the value of trying to look at the four things together yeah, so, so it's the politics in england and the drive for attainment and youngsters are in my experience uh have been you know, like you said there, parents are encouraged to take their children away rather to keep the exam results high. Uh, and I think that that's a, a, and it's easier for them in England to just say, we're not interested, which is what they're really saying when they exclude youngsters. We are not. We haven't got time for you. We're going to focus on the ones that are going to give us good results. Uh, and that's how many of those schools are actually surviving based on head teachers are driven by their exact academic results. Their, their pay is, is driven by that. So that's why I say it's a different ball game. I mean, I, I would agree with almost everything you said, actually, um, except for I don't think you can take England out of the equation because the reason I say it is because they face the same pressures and it's exactly the same discourse in, in England, as you know, teachers leaving by the drone. It's a massive problem of recruitment and, and, and retention and coming into teacher training as well. You know, numbers crashed and the problem will get worse. So when you said, you know, teachers feel behaviours got worse, and resources have got worse. Well, of course, the two are, are hand in hand, and that, that's part of the problem. So we we, we never uh, spend time in blaming individual teachers for that because we understand mm. the, the pressures that they're, they're under. However, within England, as you say, it's a you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a mess in terms of you try to categorise what schools are. There's so many different types of schools, free schools. You know, it, it goes on. Uh, I don't want to start naming them all. However, even within that system, some are more like Scotland, far more like Scotland or, or Wales or, or, or Northern Ireland. And, and because even though they've got the same pressures, they're able to stand back and say, actually, these, the, these things are important. So you'll hear sometimes schools are known as a school that are good with SEN or a school. It was a question earlier about we didn't mention um, traveller Irish uh, gypsy kids who are, who are by far the most excluded youngsters. In, in, in the UK. There are some schools that don't do that. Um, so I think what we need to do is look at why it is that some schools can change their cultures or can you know, keep against the, the trend, it, it, if you like. And I, I think the similarities there are, are what we can learn a lot from. Because as I say, I think the drivers, Peter in particular, which you know, if I, I had a plea to any any policy make out there that it really is not a good way to measure any any system is is to base your your funding and your policy decisions made made on those tests because what it's doing is ignoring 
those 20, 30 percent of children who are always going to struggle and certainly would struggle in a, in a, in a PISA test. So um, pretty much in agreement with you, but I don't think we can. And, and also when you think of um, where, where people write about exclusion, and admittedly we're looking at English papers, but the discourse is much higher in the United States, America, in Australia, New Zealand to some, some degree, Canada. It's mostly in the in certain countries. If you go to bits of Europe, they think we're completely mad. I mean, I mean, there's no other word for it. They think, what on earth is going on? Now, it's not to say things are not happening. You know, but Germany, Norway, other countries got a real problem with children just leaving school early, particularly in the in the gymnasium mm -hmm. type, 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 type system. But there's something that's going on. Maybe it's the it's the British legacy of of, of, of schooling that, that pushes performance up uh, beyond the rights of, and needs of, of, of other children. The very low rate in Northern Ireland is very striking, consistently low, relatively low. Do you think that's genuine? And if so, why? And do you know how that compares with the rest of Ireland? Is there something we can learn from that? I know if our colleagues are here, and I think there's at least one on, on that, they say the statistics are so bad in Northern Ireland compared to England, Scotland, Wales. I mean, they, 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 are, they are, they're very dubious about quality of, of the overall statistics. But, but, but they're also, um, you know, Northern Ireland is, is, is one local authority. So they know a lot of, of teachers, so they've got a good sense of what's going on, and they do see some really good examples of in a really difficult mm -hmm. situation. And you know, Northern Ireland, you know, the government hasn't been functioning. All sorts of things have, uh, are are difficult, as as we know. But, but you know, there are examples where I think more than anecdotally that you know that they are doing better. I would say than England. I I if I'd had more time, one of the things I would have loved to go into was that question around Northern Ireland because I think that's right. Mm -hmm. we, we, I'm pretty sure the data they don't collect as detailed data, but there also is a real un 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 unreliability perhaps about what we do know. But one of the things that's really striking is that in the other three nations that we look at, um, the there's much more recent guidance and policy um, uh, around exclusion. And although I, I didn't speak about this in detail, it is worth um, our colleagues, our Northern Irish and Northern. Northern Irish colleagues, my apologies, um, remind us that they, the guidance that they need to use goes from 1998, in one case, that's the promotion of good behaviour and discipline in schools. They have another one from 2001 that they use. This is not like, you know, years ago, this is what they use now. And they have one called guidance for the education otherwise than at school, so there's alternatives, 2014. And the most recent, and I, I hope I'm wrong, but I think I've got this right. The most recent guidance is from 2022, and it's and it looks specifically and only at the use of restraint and seclusion. Now that's awful. I'm sorry, but I just have to say that that's a that's a really hard situation for children, for their families, and for the staff working in the schools. It's awful. On the other hand, one of the other things we've learned through the project is how much collective pressure that comes from other organizations in Northern Ireland, perhaps in a way we don't see elsewhere. Yeah, so mm. children's rights, lobbies, child law organizations, um, charities, NGOs, all bring pressures and, and make some difference, make a significant difference in ways that we maybe just haven't had to see elsewhere, but it's really worth noting. So Northern Ireland's a lovely complex a fascinating sort of contrast. Hi, thanks. Um, maybe a more light-hearted question, but first of all, Good. thanks for a very interesting lecture. My question is, if funding wasn't an issue, what is the research you would do now to try and take things forward? Right, I'm going to have a go at this. <laughs> I want research on those everything else's that are to do with exclusion and maybe exclusion, but might be inclusion and we don't really know. I want research on the disproportionalities. 
I absolutely think we are missing something really fundamental if we don't do that. And I think those two things would give us a good start. I'd really also like us to maybe mobilize research more actively around the support that staff and schools need. Because I think they're, you know, I think the profession wants to do a good job, deserves the resources to do a good job. How is it that we can't kind of mobilize resources to make that happen? So there's something that research can do, which I've gone back to David Rafe again about, you know, research being used to, for, you know, for policy formation. So that would be my three, that would be one of the three things. If I could just come back on that and yeah. say, I would, if I had the money, yeah. I'd like to fund the last of the things you said, yeah. because I think the notion of looking at how teachers can be supported to help children who are showing distressed behaviour, yeah. and I think that is the right term for everyone to use, it is distressed behaviour. Um, if we could do more research about where people are already doing work. So I, yeah. I did some work in Glasgow around play therapy in nursery mm -hmm. and primary situations, which is really therapeutic work with children mm -hmm. who are distressed. And I, yeah. I just think we need to see more research around this. So mm -hmm. thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, I just wanted to follow up um, on that. Yeah, really important point. Um, and yeah, the, just the lecture is really, really interesting. Um, and it's obviously such a complex issue. Um, what learning from this good life and other research that you have done um, is there? You've talked about some of things already, so restorative practice that could be shared from this with all the countries um, at school or local authority or national level to address mm. temporary exclusion or un unofficial exclusions. That in terms of mobilizing that, we need to be like sharing what what is working. So what is some of the learning about good practice that is happening? Yeah, maybe I'll also tie that into quite a lot of people pointing things out. And, and I've tried to summarize. A lot of people talk about there's one size fits all does not fit kids in school, and particularly kids who are either being excluded or at risk of being excluded or come from impoverished backgrounds, for, 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 for example. You, know, you see the kids who, if they've been sleep deprived or not eating enough, you know, it's very difficult for and people talk about other, you know, cultural and other difference, neurodiversity, you know, usually based disability and, 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 and so on. And just to pick up Joan Moe's point, so Joan talked, um, and here she talks about, really, we should be looking at systems, structures and cultures that may in the ability to serve, serve to marginalised children and young people from really early on. And if I was to have the money, I'd do far more research on what early early intervention really looks like. And I really mean early as young as you can, but also whenever things arise. So, you know, I always get castigated for bringing Finland into it. But, you know, that, that's the one thing that was really noticeable when you look at what was different about that, that system to ours. And I think it may be getting worse, but... but it was that they threw resource when they thought something a child needed help. They looked at the they threw resource in. As a result, didn't have anywhere near as many uh, issues to deal with um, later on. So, how can we actually really do inclusion in practice? It does need resourcing. I take your point over that. I think one of the things I find very frustrating about this argument is I think we already know a great deal about how to work with young people in difficulty or distressed. There's been terrific practice. Most of it has been short term. Very little of it has been continued, continually funded. Mm -hmm. And in a way, we also need something which is which is going to look back at all these different projects that have been successful in, in supporting young people in schools mm -hmm. and trying to put that together into one big kind of framework. Yeah. Yeah. Our, our, we are constantly looking for the next magic bullet yeah. and actually we already do know a lot about what works we already know a lot about lots of stuff to do with, this, with these issues and what I find really frustrating is that same thing is that we don't follow the evidence we don't even allow ourselves to bring it into the discussions often enough 
And it is really frustrating because we have lots of good evidence about things that work. Restorative practice is, is, is just such a good example, but it's not the only one, you know? Um, but anything that builds a good positive ethos and the ways in which that can be done. We know those things work, but we're constantly looking for something new. It's like we're just tied to innovation for its own sake. As though that's going to help. I'm going to ask a question now. <laughs> um, I was particularly struck by the negative impact on the whole school and on other pupils of exclusion. Yeah. And I just wonder if, I mean, that is, is I wouldn't say counterintuitive, but it certainly goes against the so-called mm -hmm. common sense mm -hmm. view. And I wonder, you know, well, A, I would like to know more about what are the mechanisms by which it has a negative impact on the school and on other pupils and their attainment, but also how do we get that message out? Because that is the sort of message that is more likely to convince politicians, for example. So forget about, you know, consider the politicians are, are concerned about their PISA results and so on. Well, one way to improve the PISA result might be to deal with exclusions, whether temporary, lawful, unlawful, mm -hmm. or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. We, the, the studies that have, I, I, do, I think this research isn't something we've been talking about a lot, certainly in my, to my knowledge, in Scotland and the UK. I think our project has begun to drop it into relevant conversations much more proactively. Um, and I think there will probably be some pushback because it's mostly from North America um, and we don't need them telling us what to do. Should fund the research in Scotland Maybe and the other UK nations. That's right. And actually, I do think that's valuable because there are things that play out very differently for us. There are big issues that are probably the same, but there are probably things we need to understand at our local level. So I think until we can do that, we probably need to be cautious about the ways in which the internals work when we look at that research. But, I mean, it's got to be a starting point for discussion, more than that. I think we should probably draw things to a close now. I think we're hopefully got a flavour of the questions that are there online. They just, I'm sorry you can't see them in a way actually because they just keep coming and there's lots of really, really interesting comments that we all want to gather up later on. Um, but yeah, I think that's probably... Lovely. Lovely. Just to give you an idea of who else is out there. Lots of engagement <laughs> there from online. Thanks to everybody for those questions and comments. And I will thank you. Thank you, Gillian. Thank you, Ian. I think that was um, enlightening. You want me over here? Yeah. Oh, okay. I've got to come over here. <laughs> um, thank you both. Enlightening, thoughtful, thought provoking. Um, hopefully not too depressing. I can't remember who said that. Um, uh, but also, I think just really wonderful to hear the work that you are doing to take this forward. I know we've heard what it would be lovely to, if you had all the money in the world, what would we do? Um, hopefully, funding will be forthcoming and you can continue with these pursuits. But I think first and foremost tonight as well. Um, a real reflection of the legacy of David Rafe. So many, many thanks for that. Um, I'd like to make some other thank yous if that's okay as well. I'd like to thank um, in particular, Kathy Housen, who's a, a former colleague of David Rafe. So thank you very much for, for your support for this event. Um, and Pauline, who has been doing an amazing job here, pulling the event together um, and making sure that we have the opportunity to celebrate the work of David Rafe and uh, the work of our colleagues here today as well, um, and Dorcas as well. Um, your support and Laura, I think, is still here. Uh, she's not gone. Um, I am going to thank Pauline because um, she gave me a list of a few things to say at the beginning, which I clearly didn't do. So I shall um, do some of that now. Um, it's just to let you all know that uh, we are obviously recording this. Um, and there have been some photos, but those recordings will be made available to you um, afterwards. Um, so we'll be in touch about those. Um, and also just to, to say that there are refresh, refreshments for you available now. So I do hope that you will stay with us for a short while um, to, to carry on some of these, um, uh, these conversations. And I'm gonna thank everybody for joining us online as well. We have a large number of you there. So it's been fabulous to have you with us um, and fabulous to have everybody else in the room as well. So um, on behalf of uh, Gillian and Ian and on the school, very many, many thanks for being with us today.